Mississippi celebrates its bicentennial in 2017, and Mississippi Roads takes a look at Mississippi's history. We feature a story on Tejada, Mississippi's first capital building, and we fly along with the Key Brothers on their historical flight over Meridian. Down Mississippi Road. Now, welcome to Mississippi Roads. I'm your host, Walt Grayson. We're in the Vicksburg Military Park, and we're here to help celebrate Mississippi's 200th anniversary, Vicksburg being one of the major events in Mississippi's history. After a 47-day siege on July 4th of 1863, Vicksburg was surrendered to General Grant, and that was just the day after Robert E. Lee lost at the Battle of Gettysburg the turning point for the South in the Civil War. Of course, it's not the only event in Mississippi history, the Civil War in Vicksburg. Let's start off with a look at some of the major events in our history that have led us to where we are today and are leading us to where we will be. There's so much that has happened in Mississippi in the two centuries since Mississippi became a state. You know, first it was the year of the Native Americans, and then the European explorers came, and then the American Revolution. The revolution even touched our part of the country, with many loyalists to England moving to this area to get away from the war on the eastern seaboard. Clay Williams, who is the sites director for the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, says during this early formative period, seeds were planted and roots sunk of what would grow into what Mississippi is today. And yet that late colonial and early statehood period is so easily skipped over. I think about today's basic social studies, Mississippi history educational system. They talk a lot about the Native Americans. You may run through the, the colonial period with the Spanish and French and British, and then you, okay, Mississippi becomes a state, and then it seems like the next thing they talk about, okay, and then the Civil War happens. And it's like, well, 45, 50 years there, they just, and I understand sometimes they have to due to time periods. They've, they've got a lot to cover in Mississippi history, but it's just, it's just glossed over so much, and there's so much richness to it. It's such a dichotomy of stories of, of, of growth, of, of expansion, of, of people making wealth, at the same time, Native Americans losing their land, and of course, the slavery issue where a lot of this white wealth is built upon. I think that is just, a, the, the whole dichotomy of that is pretty intriguing, I think. Well, after the French, and then the English, and then the Spanish in turn won and then lost what would become Mississippi. The fledgling United States got it, and it became the Mississippi Territory. And the territory consisted of what today includes all of Mississippi as well as Alabama. And the capital of this vast territory was way over in the western corner almost, Natchez. Then it was moved to nearby Washington. And then we stayed a territory for an inordinately long time before we became a state. And a lot of that is because of the entanglements left over from the colonial era. There was a system in place uh, via, via the government to how territories became states. And it was kind of natural that it would be the first phase, would be a territorial phase. And once certain requirements were met, these territories could become states. And Mississippi, of course, is just like the rest of them. There was a Mississippi Territory from 1798 to 1817, very much almost 19 years of being a territory. I think the longest time a territory was a territory until it became a state. Um, before this place became a territory, you had everybody from France, England, Spain, even the state of Georgia had established land grants in the area that we now know as Mississippi. It took a long time to sort through that and determine who owned what land where and how before even new land could be, you know, uh, sold to uh, uh, settlers and residents. So it just took a long time for that to take place. And then there was also the War of 1812 and the Creek War, which happened, you know, around obviously 1812, 1813, 1814, 1815, that caused a lot of uh, issues, obviously, uh, internationally as well as locally and whatnot. And until that could be done is when it, it finally was time for Mississippi to become a state. And I can't overemphasize that people were coming to this area for land, whether they're, they've just 
not done been very successful along the Atlantic seaboard or just or whatnot. And so this desire for land is so big and this this conflicting land claims it was, was so difficult. Um, on top of that Native American issue where for a while the Native Americans had really done such a great job of kind of playing the Europeans against each other. And so now that the Europeans are removed, they are kind of just up against the United States and they don't have anywhere to play against. And so there's this this uneasiness with, okay, people are running into this land, there are still Native Americans here, how are we gonna handle this? How are we gonna keep the peace and the, the sovereignty of the Native Americans with these you know, white settlers flooding into the land? That created lots of difficulties that needed to be addressed. And unfortunately, they became addressed by treaties that eventually moved the Native Americans um, out of Mississippi for the most part. The first constitution for the new state of Mississippi was drafted and signed in a Methodist church that once sat on the campus of Jefferson College in Washington in Adams County. Jefferson College is still here, although it hadn't operated as a school for well over a half century. But the church is gone. There's a monument where it stood, and the church isn't the only piece of real estate associated with early statehood that's no longer with us. Assembly Hall in Washington, that was in essence the first Capitol building of the state, is also gone. This is some old video of it before it burned in the 1990s. And there were actually plans in the early 90s to kind of restore the building and do some interpretation when it was lost to fire. Washington used to be kind of the cultural center uh, of the state. The college was there. There were very, there were society of cultural refinement and, and literature, and that was kind of the hub of, of things. But once Mississippi became a state, Natchez then became the state capital. And again, it was only for a couple years. They moved to Columbia, and then while in Columbia, they made a decision to move it more to the central part of the state. One of the greatest quotes I've ever heard about Jackson being chosen as capital is, Everybody could at least be pleased with it because it was so far away from everybody. Nobody could be happy and think it's close to us. We have power. Well, it was far removed from everybody. So everybody, I guess, could, could live with that. Well, one of the issues that had to be ironed out before the state could become a state was what would it look like? And then also, what would be the name of this new state? Again, it, when the territory was established after adding additional land, the Mississippi Territory was the current states of Mississippi and Alabama. And at one point in time, uh, the people along the Mississippi River wanted the area to go in as one state, this one big state, while the people in the what is known as the eastern backwoods, closer to the Mobile area, they wanted to be divided because they felt like their needs weren't being met. They were kind of the, the second-class citizens. After the War of 1812 and this massive influx of population into what we know today as Alabama, completely changed that. Now, those people in the, quote, used to be backwoods area wanted to be go in as one big state knowing they would hold the power because that's where the population was. And those in Natchez then decided, oh no, we need, we need to separate and be two different states. And that is, of course, what eventually happened. So that's a very intriguing story. The other interesting thing is there was a vote on what to call Mississippi. At one point, uh, one individual pushed to, it, to call it Washington, for obvious reasons after George Washington. And I think it lost by a very close vote of like 23 to 18, or I don't know that exactly right, but a very close vote there on, on what to call Mississippi. So some interesting little factoids like that, I think make it kind of interesting. Prior to the Civil War, there were more you know, millionaires in Mississippi than anywhere else. I, I've never really checked that. I think it's more of a saying, but I don't, I don't doubt the, the truthfulness of that as there was, there was a lot of wealth in that, but that wealth was in slaves and in land and in cotton. And then of course you take away the, the slavery has ended and Mississippi is, is, is still struggling today with where we've gotten, you know, how we've dealt with that change of how we are. But that all gets established during this early, this early time period. On that note, we'll leave it, observing that evidently Mr. Faulkner was correct when he wrote, the past isn't dead, it isn't even past. Mississippi, now with a 200-year statehood past that has so many elements defining its present and future. The house back behind me, this is the Shirley House. This is on the battlefield in Dixburg. This is the only house still standing out here. The 45th Illinois Infantry used this home as their headquarters during the siege in 1863. You know, we have a lot of old homes still standing in Mississippi, and a lot of them from the Civil War era, and some of them even older than that, like the one we're about to visit, that served as Mississippi's first capital building, Tejada in Natchez. <music> Thank you. 
buildings have funny stories, and all buildings tell many, many stories, and Tejada tells more than most. Tejada is the oldest building, oldest government capital building still standing. It tells so many stories. It tells the story of Spanish Natchez. It tells the story of the kind of businesses that were operating through their ads. It talks about the kind of entertainments that people had in a world before radio, television, or you know, sufficient population to have theaters and things uh, for performances. And then it also tells the story of our young state government. It then becomes a restoration story and a tourism story as George and Margaret Moss were among the city's pioneers in restoration. Perhaps the house is most known for the heroic efforts my mother had in getting the house restored. I don't know whether she was aware that it had been the home of the Mississippi legislature, both territorial and state. A newspaper article in the 1850s describes the house as the first brick house built in the city of Natchez. Well, they would make it the first brick house in the state. I don't think there's any doubt about that because there wasn't much in the rest of Mississippi uh, in 1800 or 1798, whenever it was begun. It was the most valuable house in town on the 1805 tax roll. It was a big mansion to territorial era residents of the city of Natchez. Manuel Tejada bought the house, uh, the property, in 1798. He was uh, from Castile, Spain. When Natchez was under Spanish control, few Spaniards were here, but Tejada was one of them. So Tejada is important as a house that was built in the waning days of Spanish influence. The brickwork is beautiful. It's laid in Flemish bond, and the Flemish bond is reserved for the two public elevations. The other thing it does, it has a roof that is both hipped and gabled, and that's unusual. You're used to seeing a hipped roof where you have, you know, the four wall elevations slant, you know, to a central line. And, or you have a gable where you end in a triangle at each end of the house. Well, it's hipped to the street, but gabled on the other end. It's amazing how many descendants there are of Tejadas. So we have all kinds of Tejadas show up all the time wanting to see the home that their ancestor created. Manuel Tejada was an enterprising person, no doubt about that. We find ads as we go through territorial era newspapers. Maybe a tailor will advertise and he's located in Manuel Tejada's brick house. Uh, somebody making silhouettes described as taking profiles of people is doing it at Mr. Tejada's. There are dancing academies at Mr. Tejada's, taverns at Mr. Tejada's. There's even an elephant exhibition in 1810 where you could pay 50 cents and see what was described as the only elephant then traveling in the United States. Every kind of entertainment you can imagine from elephants to wax museums, Mr. Tejada's hosted them all. And I guess there were people who might think the legislature was a humorous attraction too, you know. Manuel Tejada died in 1817. Edward Turner bought Tejada upon Manuel Tejada's death. He was an attorney general. He was a representative. He was a Supreme Court justice. He was elected to the Senate in the 1840s, still active. So he buys Tejada, and I, it's obvious with what comes next why he was buying it. He probably thought it would be a good investment, and he was also living across the street at a house called Holly Hedges. So he looked at Tejada every day, and then he acquired it and leased it to the legislature. And then when the state constitution was written and adopted and Mississippi became a state, Natchez was to be, I don't know that it was ever considered to be permanent. It was just determined that the legislature would first meet in Natchez, which it did. And I'm sure Edward Turner was all set to collect the rent and, and to host everyone at Tejada. The decay of that particular neighborhood, primarily associated with a railroad station coming through right before 1910. When train stations came in, neighborhoods around them would sometimes begin to decline because of the noise, the coal dust, whatever else. The house was falling apart. The windows were broken and other places there were boards that had been added on to enclose back porches that were falling off. My earliest memories were as 
an 11 year old. My mother and dad coming to me saying that they know that we've loved the house that we've lived in on Pearl Street and have been working on diligently since I was four. But they found another house in town that they want to restore. And we'd be moving over there that summer. It was the summer of 1964. Margaret Moss was somebody that, if she saw something needed doing, she tended to do it. I think of it as Margaret's project. It was very much George's project too. And they worked on it a lot themselves. They were doers themselves. I think it was the challenge of it. I think the house was invited to be on the fall tours pretty early on after they got it restored. When the house was first invited to be on what was then called a candlelight tour, which is now called Natchez Pilgrimage Tours, it was many years later before they were invited to be on the spring tour. You know, we're, we're all just interested in people's stories. How does a house relate to your life? How does it relate to your life story? To preserve an important part of history and to share that with others, I consider it an honor to have the heritage that I have to get to share that. What you see back behind me is what's left of the old Union ironclad gunboat, the Cairo. It's on display here at the National Park in Vicksburg. The Cairo was sunk in the Yazoo River between Vicksburg and Yazoo City by what we call a, a mine today. They call them a torpedo back in those days. And there's a lot of technology involved with all of this. The gunboat itself was the latest thing developed especially for the Civil War. And the mine that brought it down was electrically detonated. That was brand new, making the Cairo the very first warship ever in the world to be sunk by an electrically detonated mine. Now, in our next story, we have uh, some more technology that was brand new and on the cutting edge for the day. We jumped from Vicksburg all the way across the state to Meridian and up to the year 1935. That's the year that the Key brothers, Al and Fred Key, set the world's flight endurance record in their airplane, the Ole Miss. And in the process, they developed two or three things. First of all, and most importantly probably, is they developed a way for refueling airplanes in midair, which is essentially used to this very day. And they also saved a little airport in Meridian. Key Field in Meridian, Mississippi is named after Al and Fred Key, who in 1935 put the small town of Meridian on the map. The Flying Key Brothers, and uh, they were famous, especially around here. But uh, you, you could fly off someplace, and if you landed some airport, aviation people knew anything about aviation, had heard of or knew about the Key Brothers, you know. In the early days of flying, Al and Fred Key were barnstormers and aerial acrobats. They were just fascinated with aviation. Uh, they uh, did everything they could to do something with airplanes. Al and Fred Key had been running a flying service out at Bonita Airstrip, which is outside of town. And they were given the job of being managers of the airport and the city fathers were about to deem it necessary to shut down the airport to save finances. It was the Great Depression. They were managers of the airport here in Meridian, and somehow they had to keep that airport alive and kicking, and uh, they uh, started these flights to draw attention to what could be done coming out of that airport. Their tenacity is what kept it afloat during that time frame before World War II. In the 30s, aviation records were being set and broken all the time. The media and the public just couldn't get enough. The Key brothers figured that if they could break the existing 24-day nonstop flight record, the city of Meridian would have to keep the municipal airport open. Evidence shows that they started their ideas about this, these flights back in around 1930, 31, back in there. 
and they started r realizing there were certain things they needed. And one of the biggies was mid-air refueling. Uh, they had this man named A.D. Hunter there who was a genius. He had a, about an eighth grade education, but he could invent or do anything. And so uh, Hunter perfected a valve that would enable them to refuel in air without the danger of spilling gas because this was a radial engine. They were in a Curtis Robin monoplane, 165 horsepower engine. And before they took off the flight, they had modified it. They took out all the seats, put in a 150 gallon fuel tank, and they had built the pilot seat into the front end of the fuel tank. And in the back, in the baggage compartment, they put a mattress of it. They built a scaffolding on each side of the nose of the airplane, up by the engine with a whirling propeller right here, two or three feet in front of them. And it was just uh, uh, tubular steel welded together, and you're out in the free air there, uh, whistling in your ears, you know. And uh, Fred's mission, part of the mission, was to climb out onto the, that scaffolding with the wrench and the oil can. So they began their preparations and they had two failed attempts. The first two attempts uh, were, they got, had bad gas one time and uh, the engine gave so much trouble it had to come in. The second one back in, these were both back in 1934. The second attempt, uh, the wind and weather got so bad. The two failed ones uh, in 34 uh, did not set them up very well with the community to, to make it in, in 35. Well, by that third flight, there were about, uh, I estimated, 200 people or less to show up to see them take off because they just knew they weren't going to make it. But as things built and grew, they kept hearing that little, like I call it a mad mosquito, uh, that was constantly going around uh, the community and out through these checkpoints uh, and uh, staying in the air. And the longer it stayed, the more people got interested in it. I heard of them, you know, in my first uh, word of the Key Brothers when my dad would come in and say, are those boys still up? And he'd turn on the radio and he'd turn around and tell me, he says, yeah, that's, they're still up there. And he was real interested in that every day when he got home from work, were they still up there? And they stayed up there, each day getting closer to the record, all the while having fuel and food delivered to them from a second chase plane. Yeah, their wives would uh, fix the meals and they would put it in a sack and then uh, put it in the refueling plane to be let down. When the 24th day came and went, the Key Brothers continued their now record-setting flight. They got to a point where they just had to call them down. Their father was a doctor. And if I recall correctly, he just said, now it's time. You've broken the record, get it, get it down here. So, so they uh, decided to come on in. And as they came in over the horizon, they could just start seeing dust. So there were these lines of A models heading for um, uh, the airport. And they could start to see that, my gosh, this, this is starting to be a really big deal. After 27 days of flight, the Key Brothers had traveled over 52,000 miles, consumed over 6,000 gallons of fuel and 300 gallons of oil. Their historic flight has had a lasting impact on aviation history. And a lot of people began to look at it and say, well, you know, if they can fly that thing for 27 days and refuel in air, then planes must be safe. And so it increased the uh, airlines passenger business, it increased the freight business, so their world record brought about the uh, recognition by most folks of the safety of flying. Alan and Fred Key and A.D. Hunter and their compatriots had an impact here 65, 70 years later. An event that for all practical purposes should not have taken place in a place like Meridian, but yet they hung on and they did it. Well, 
That's about all the time we have for our visit to the National Military Park in Vicksburg. By the way, they've got about 1,300 of these monuments like this scattered about the park that describe the history of the siege of Vicksburg. And that was such a momentous moment in the history of the state of Mississippi that during our bicentennial year, this would be a great time to come visit the park, or any time for that matter. If you'd like information about anything you've seen on the show, contact us at mpbonline.org slash Mississippi Roads. And make sure you like our Mississippi Public Broadcasting Facebook page. Till next time, I'm Walt Grayson. I'll be seeing you on Mississippi Roads. Roads is made possible in part by the generous support of viewers like you. Thank you.